short answer to the question of why I'm an atheist is that I was simply raised without any belief in God. Um, I like to think that I'm a rational person, and I like to think that I would have come to the, pretty much the same conclusions regarding religion if I had been raised in a religious household. Um, but I am too well aware of our human cognitive biases and mental failings to honestly believe that that is the case. Um, pretty much, I have to acknowledge that the single biggest factor in me being an atheist is that I was raised without a faith. Um, and so this video really isn't so much about the rational arguments against belief in uh, God, but is really actually an overview of how I was raised without religion. Um, I was born to two parents who themselves were not religious. Um, my maternal grandmother um, was probably an atheist who'd reasoned her way to that decision and had explicitly rejected um, religion. My other grandparents were probably woolly liberal Anglicans of some variety um, who had some vague notion of God and goodness and almost certainly attended church for the community and the tradition in doing so. Um, and because they would likely have been shunned were they not to do that. Um, I say probably about that because religion was simply not something that was discussed during my childhood. Uh, not, not because it was taboo or because my parents refused to discuss it, but simply that they generally didn't talk much about it and I really had no interest in it. Um, my mother's an atheist. Um, and she, but she has some mild new age ideas about there being something bigger than us and possibly karma and the power of positive thinking and visualising and producing our reality or something, although very mild views along those lines. Uh, my father is, does not seem interested in religion one way or the other. Um, during my childhood my mum would have these occasional pangs where she would worry that she had not given a sufficient exposure to religion in order to make our own minds up. And so she would have these sort of feelings like maybe we should, us children that is, go off to church a bit, you know. Uh, not that she would particularly take us and she certainly wasn't going to force it on us. So because she was afraid occasionally about indoctrinating us in her non-belief, um, whenever any, whenever a religious friend of ours would um, invite us to go to church, she would always encourage us to go along with them. And I can remember one such time in particular. I was probably eight or nine, and I think I'd been on a sleepover with a friend of mine. Uh, it must have been a Saturday night, I guess. And then the next morning, they we all trooped off to church, me along with the family of my and my my friend. Um, and then during the main service, all us children went off for a special, I don't know, age-appropriate sort of discussion of religious things. Can't quite remember what it was. Anyway, I remember whoever was whoever the adult was asked us, you know, asked the group in general, you know, what do you know about God? What do, what do the people here know about God? And um, I'd recently watched the film Jason and the Argonauts um, and absolutely loved it. And so I remember I stuck my hand up and they were like, oh, what do you know? And I was really, I gave this confident dissertation on Zeus and how he's this big beardy guy who lives up in the sky and he throws thunderbolts and all the rest of it. <laughs> I do remember on some level... I was, although I was young, I knew that this wasn't the answer that this person wanted, but I didn't quite under, I couldn't understand why. Um, you know, I was giving a really good account of this god Zeus, and I remember the the, the adult saying something along the lines that you know, um, Zeus doesn't actually exist. Um, well, what I really want to know is, you know, does anybody here know about the real god? And I remember thinking at the time, like, how is it that we know that Zeus doesn't exist? And you know, why do people, and I even wonder, why do people stop believing in Zeus? Like, why do we all switch to, you know, the Christian God, I guess? Um, not that I had any answers to that. Uh, later, and I was a little bit older, um, I used to go to a youth group uh, run by a Baptist church in my area. Um, and the reason I did is because one of my school friends was the son of the pastor. So he invited me along, and I went to this youth group every Friday night. Every night, Friday night, we would go. Um, and I went, for, pretty sure I went for several years and even went on a few church camps. Um, and I even remember my parents coming along because the church camps um, were for families to go. The parents would come and the children. And I remember my, par my mum in particular actually came to one of them simply because I wanted to go. Um, and she was like, oh, sure. 
Um, and I later found out that it was actually supposed to be a kind of a church retreat where the adults got to discuss about the direction of the church and where they were going and all the rest of it while us kids had a good time. And I remember my mum, you know, the atheist there, um, actually apparently was very welcomed and they actually had lots of questions of her about, you know, what people who weren't in their church thought about their church. I don't know if she had any good answers for them. Anyway, um, the interesting thing is, although I went to a lot of this stuff um, for a couple of years, or at least I went to the youth group every couple, you know, for a couple of years every week, um, I can't actually remember any discussions going on about religion at any of these events. Um, I'm pretty sure that the youth group and all that these events were really just outreach at, for people my age. I was, I don't know, eight, nine, ten, maybe. Um, and either they weren't proselytizing at all, or I somehow managed to completely ignore all of those religious bits. Whatever it was, it was not very overt. There was no big push. There was, there was nothing. It was just a fun youth event. And so, yeah, there really wasn't any kind of religious stuff going on that I can remember, um, even at these yeah, Baptist church. I have some vague memory of doing some comparative religion study when I was about 12 at school. Um, as part of our curriculum. I, I remember learning a little bit about Islam and some of the, maybe some of the other faiths. Um, and then that was it, that was age 12. Um, my entire high school experience, I don't think there were, I had a single brush with religion. Uh, my friend, the pastor's son, uh, went to a different high school from me and I really didn't have much contact with him. And I don't know if, I'm not sure, I don't know if, but certainly nobody in my group of friends at high school were out, um, Chris, you know, religious people, not overtly religious. Um, I didn't, I don't remember even studying anything about religions, anything at all. Um, I think late in my high school career, maybe I was about 16 or so, I was working in a local fast food restaurant and one of the other guys who worked there who I became good friends with, um, he was Lebanese, come came to Australia and um, yeah as a very young person so really just as Australians and else but he obviously came from a Muslim background and he kind of had some vague he was sort of a cultural Muslim who had some sense that it was you know like, like a lot of Christians have this sort of belief in belief but not necessarily belief itself um, yeah that was it Actually, interestingly, I say all that, I had a, one of my first girlfriends at the age of 16, again, she also was, she came from a family who were Muslim, and, but you know, we never even talked about it, because it wasn't even a big thing for her, as far as I could tell, it was a big thing for her parents, and that was it. Now, in my first year at university, I did a unit on the philosophy of religion. Um, I was kind of, at this point I was kind of interested in religion, and I was interested in philosophy. I remember thinking it quite odd when I found out that the lecturer was actually a priest. I believe he was a Catholic priest. Um, I remember thinking that was sort of a bit strange, that he would be doing this philosophy of religion course, um, you know. But not only did it... I, I honestly think it was the... If anything, he was more biased against the arguments for God. Uh, whether that was because he on he was one of those theists who believed that rational argumentation is not a path to God, or whether he was bending over backwards to not appear biased, or maybe he was just an intellectually honest person. But he presented the course was basically a presentation of all of the the, the classical arguments for the existence of God. And after we did each of them, there was the classical you know the the arguments against all of the usual objections, and so. There it was, laid out clear. Here's all the arguments that basically theists have been able to put together for, well, at least not, not really theists, but Christians have put together for arguments for God, and here's all of the objections. And I remember coming out the other side being convinced that there really couldn't be any well-known arguments for the existence of God that could stand up to criticism. Um, I remember thinking that if, if you know, the university lecturer... Catholic priest at you know our top university in the state not that really means much but um, did not have any knock down solid arguments for the existence of God then they probably didn't exist or at least they couldn't have been well known at that point um, I also remember being left with we talked about the problem of evil um, 
and how that was, you know, and what some of the possible sort of theistic responses were. And I remember really noting that there were no good rational responses to it. I mean, there were there are responses, and you, you know, to it, and some of these you can sort of justify your way through it. But I remember thinking that none of this was a solid response. There was no aha. That makes sense now that you know that's how we can have evil. I remember just thinking, oh yeah, okay. So you've managed to define your god or whatever in such a way as to sort of exempt them from that criticism. It didn't feel like a sort of a direct sort of um, defense of the god of the Bible, at least, or a sort of a strong sense of god. I do remember at the time, actually, um, I think I'd done another philosophy course, or, or maybe it was the same philosophy course, but a different section of it where we weren't talking about religion, and we did come across um, Occam's Razor, and I remember naively stumbling across an argument, sort of in my own head, unaware that, you know, you know naively thinking that this was some great discovery of mine, um, that basically realising that God couldn't possibly exist, that I thought I had the, the solid knockdown argument for it. Um, Essentially, my reasoning was that there basically can't be any good empirical evidence for God. Because if there was, um, such evidence would be out there, it would be well known, and it would be openly acknowledged. You I mean, if God had been known to have done various things, if God you know, intervened in human affairs in a particular way, then it would be irrefutable. Um, and, then, and therefore, um, and people would be converted. And the fact that there wasn't, you know, that, that the world was not full of Christians 2,000 years after Christ, that this 2,000 years um, has not seen a steady sort of, a steady unhalted um, conversion of everybody to Christianity um, based on rational argument, um, to me made a strong argument that there can't be this well-known, openly acknowledged, you know, irrefutable e empirical evidence for God. And therefore the only gods that you could really argue for, this is what I thought at the time, um, is a non-interventionist God. Now I didn't realise, at the time I wasn't even aware of the theist, deist kind of distinction or any of it. And so I sort of went, well, if, they, if you can only have this sort of non-interventionist God, um, it, it could mean you, can, you could dismiss this God through reference to Occam's Razor. You know, this God doesn't intervene, doesn't do anything, and therefore may as well, like, why are we postulating this unnecessary metaphysical entity? And I remember, at the time, I was blown away, I thought this was the most incredible discovery. Because I remember thinking that, prior to that, I had some naive sense that, um, that religion was like flavours of ice cream. That you didn't believe based on rational argumentation. You just kind of, the different religions were like different flavours of ice cream, and everybody had their own favourite ice cream. Um, and that, that's what it was. There wasn't any rational argumentation because it wasn't that things were true or false. It was just simply, you know, you chose to believe in these things. And, the, you know, the, relig the different religions to me seemed like just preferences about how to look at the world rather than statements about things that could be true or false. And so up to that point, I sort of thought of atheists as being people who just didn't like ice cream. Um, and the various flavours of religion were just different flavours. And I, I remember thinking, I, I guess I kind of thought of, you know, the people who knock on your door, the sort of door knockers for Jehovah's Witnesses, are kind of like those people in supermarkets who give out free samples. They were just there to say, look, you know, here, try this. It might turn out to be the, the flavour you like. Um, that's kind of how I saw it. And then after having done this, like, this philosophy course, I remember realising that actually, yeah, the only kind of religion that could possibly be true that wouldn't, you know, is one that didn't really have any kind of impact in your life, and then it would be kind of silly to believe in it. Um, it was kind of like a, not even a god of the gaps, but a kind of a pantheism where you kind of go, look, you know, it's kind of like the uh, the guided evolution thing, but it was kind of like it wasn't not quite intelligent falling, but the, you know, that gravity is actually God's hand pulling things down to Earth. Um, that that's the only god you can believe in. Um, because I thought, well, you know, it, I, don't know, I remember thinking this was an incredible discovery I'd come across, that I'd been able to disprove God. And I remember thinking that this must have been a massive discovery, because if anybody else had come up with this before, if anybody had a lot of this previously, then there wouldn't be anybody who believed in gods after that. Because you would simply explain this to everybody, and people would go, ah, oh, that's right, ah, oh, wow, and there would be no God. I mean, I was in university at this point, um, 
So I'm a little bit sort of ashamed to say how naive I must have been. Um, it was only later that I came to study psychology and realised that actually these kind of rational argumentation has little sway over people in the field of religious belief. Anyway, you know, so I was disabused of that notion and actually went off for a number of years after that. I actually gave religion no real thought. Um, it really wasn't relevant to my life. I'd kind of dismissed the God of the Bible, I guess, or an interventionist God as really not being able to exist. Um, or very unlikely to be true. Um, nobody I knew was particularly religious. Uh, nobody ever wanted to talk about religion particularly. And it was only much later, and actually much more recently, that I realised that actually my little bubble of non-religious people that I lived in, although it might be a significant chunk of the population, um, there were act there are actually very religious people in society, in, our, in my society here. Um, and that they still have this really disproportionate influence on politics. Um, and I don't know if politics is sort of, for a lot of people, a boring topic, but to me it's... It is still actually... It determines a lot of important things in people's lives. The rules, that, the laws that people pass in politics, the way that money is spent, actually does make a big difference in people's lives. Not necessarily in mine, because I happen to be solidly middle class, white, educated, heterosexual, married, um, male, who, you know, cisgendered. Um, and so, you know, any political party, pretty much, all the mainstream political parties are nice to me anyway. Um, but I, I did realise later that actually there is this big, um, there is this chunk, at least, it's not even a big, but it's a chunk of people who are particularly religious who have this disproportionate power in politics um, that disadvantages, for no good reason, a whole bunch of people who, you know, happen to not be like me, and that I was living actually in a fairly sheltered world sheltered from the the troubles that these religious people were causing. Um, and then I also later discovered I, that there is a sort of a slightly organised atheist movement, as it were. Um, came across the atheist books, and then really sort of solidified my position as an atheist at that point, and kind of came across the rational argumentation again, was reminded of all of the classical arguments, was shocked to discover that the current arguments are no better, and, and in fact often are identical with just jazzed up language. Um, yeah, despite the fact that these previous, these classical arguments have been disproved from almost the time that they were advanced. Um, and so recently I've been taken to making YouTube videos um, and eventually, maybe, I might even make some decent YouTube videos about atheism if I can find something to say that hasn't already been said. So, there you go. That's how, that's why I'm an atheist. Um, basically because I was raised by parents who did not teach me to believe in God. Um, well, I hope that's been interesting. Um, certainly been fun for me to talk about, and I'll uh, see you all next time. Bye.